now that we've got a good understanding of how a displacement, velocity, and acceleration are all related for a simple harmonic oscillator, we're going to deal now with generic starting conditions. So up until now, we've been looking at cases where an oscillator has been set in motion when it starts at rest at the maximum amplitude position, or sometimes when it's in the equilibrium position and you start it with some initial velocity by hitting it. But in general, you know, a simple harmonic oscillator, it could start with an arbitrary velocity at an arbitrary displacement, and we need to be able to cope with that initial condition and find the amplitude and the initial phase. Now, since I'm a particle physicist, we're not just going to do this for a simple mass spring system or a simple pendulum. We're going to try something a bit more fun, and we're going to look at the alpha experiment at CERN that creates atoms of antimatter. Now, you may have heard about antimatter from shows like Star Trek, where they use it to power the engines. That's unless you're watching the latest version of Star Trek Discovery, which seems to have switched from antimatter to magic mushrooms. Um, but all the original Star Treks used antimatter. Uh, the other place you might have encountered antimatter is uh, the author Dan Brown wrote a book called Angels and Demons, where antimatter made at CERN was used to blow up the Vatican, or almost blow up the Vatican. Um, now, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. The amount of antimatter that we have at CERN at any one time is not even enough to warm up a cup of tea, but obviously the Pope having slightly lukewarm tea would not have made an exciting ending to his novel, so he had to elaborate a little bit. Okay, so how does, why are we interested in antimatter and how does this relate to oscillations? Well, our universe, uh, as far as we can see, is entirely made up of matter. And this is a bit of a mystery if you're a particle physicist, because when we recreate the incredibly high energy collisions that happen in the Big Bang, what we find is that we always create equal amounts of matter and antimatter. And yet here we are in a universe which was apparently created by those processes, which is entirely made of matter, and there's no antimatter in any reasonable quantities that we can see anywhere in the universe. And so the question is, how did that happen if we all started with energy right at the start of the Big Bang? So what we're looking for is a difference between matter and antimatter that could explain why we get one and not the other. And we actually found that in the 1960s with these tiny little particles called kaons or k mesons that could oscillate backwards and forwards from a kaon to an anti kaon and back again as they traveled. And we found some differences there that were very sensitive. And the only reason we could see these tiny differences was because of the oscillations of these kaons. Now today, we've seen it in quite a few more types of mesons. There's kaons, there's B mesons, and there's even now D mesons that do this oscillation trick backwards and forwards. And in fact, I worked on an experiment when I was a grad student that was uh, studying the oscillation of these kaons and trying to figure out the physics behind why we got this difference between matter and antimatter. But none of these is enough to explain the matter-antimatter asymmetry in the universe, and so alpha is taking a slightly different approach. They use CERN to create antiprotons, and then you cool these antiprotons down, which itself is actually really quite challenging, and they also create positrons, which are anti-electrons, which is a lot easier to do, and then you bring, you trap these inside what are called penning traps, and then you allow them to come together where they form neutral atoms of anti-hydrogen. That's a hydrogen with a negatively charged nucleus of an antiproton and a positively charged electron, or well, a positron that is trapped in orbit around it. And then they use lasers to excite the different energy levels in this anti-hydrogen atom to try and see if it has the same spectrum as ordinary hydrogen. One of the other experiments they did was actually just to see if it falls under gravity just like uh, normal hydrogen does. And of course, the expectation and their result was that it does indeed just fall like ordinary matter under gravity. However, in these penning traps where you trap the antiproton, the antiproton oscillates backwards and forwards 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to consider the oscillation of one of these uh, antiprotons that's trapped inside the penning trap, and we're going to use that as our example. So what we can see in this picture is a close-up of the penning trap right at the heart of the alpha experiment, and you can see how it consists of a set of metal rings which have got wires connected to them, and those wires allow you to apply and essentially put a charge on any one of the rings. So if we look at this in diagrammatic form, what we can see is we can see two rings with a third ring that we've cut away so you can see inside it sandwiched in between the two and insulated from them. And the way the trap is loaded is they use a magnetic field parallel to the axis of the cylinders. Now charged particles will move along magnetic field lines. They actually go in a helix around the magnetic field line, but they go along the magnetic field line so they can inject antiprotons into the trap and as they come in, they see the negative charge on the far ring of the, trap, uh, of the trap, and so they slow down and will eventually reflect and go back the way they came in. But before they can do that, you spring the trap by adding a negative charge to the ring that the antiproton has just come through. You apply a negative um, uh, charge to that ring, and then, of course, the antiprotons are trapped. They are trapped to move roughly along the magnetic field lines, and they are repelled by the negative charges at either end. And so you end up, as you can see here, with an antiproton oscillating backwards and forwards inside the trap, and that is going to be uh, what our question is about. So here we have the question that we're trying to solve. So we're told that we have an antiproton in the penning trap of the alpha experiment. It undergoes simple harmonic motion with a frequency of 500 kilohertz, and it has an initial velocity of 200 kilometers per second when it is five centimeters from the equilibrium position. So these are the key uh, facts. It's simple harmonic motion with a frequency of 500 kilohertz, and our initial conditions are that it has a velocity of 200 kilometers per second at five centimeters from the equilibrium. And the first part of the question asks, what is the displacement from equilibrium as a function of time? The next part is what is the maximum force on the antiproton, and the last part is a second antiproton with half the energy of the first one is now trapped. What is the amplitude of its motion? So to start with, let's go back and have a look at our antiproton in our trap and put in these initial conditions. So here we are with a diagram of the penning trap. We can see our antiproton uh, in it. We've labeled the initial displacement, that's up here at five centimeters, and we've labeled the initial velocity. Now, we know it's undergoing simple harmonic motion, so if we call the displacement from equilibrium x, which of course is a function of time, then we know that this function will look something like this, where we have an amplitude here, a, we have omega times time, where this is our angular, omega is our angular frequency, and then phi is our initial uh, phase. Now, we know that uh, omega here is equal to 2 pi times the frequency, and we were told that the frequency f here is equal to 500 kilohertz. So we know that omega is just 2 pi times that, so that is essentially 10 to the power 6 pi, or a million pi, uh, and then of course the units here are radians uh, per second, which have the same dimensions as hertz, um, but we're just putting in the radian there to remember that we've got this additional 2 pi factor, and we're talking about angular frequency, not linear frequency. So we know omega, but now we need to find the amplitude and the initial phase. So how do we do that? Because we're not starting now in a simple position where we're at maximum displacement or we're at the equilibrium position, which are the examples we've seen so far. So we've got our expression for the displacement. So next, what we want is we want to look at our um, function for the velocity. Well, this, of course, is just dx by dt. And so we differentiate 
the equation that we have above. And so we end up with minus omega a times the sine of omega t plus phi, where cosine has gone to minus sine, and because we've got omega t in here, we bring an omega factor out in front. So we've got two um, expressions here. So the next stage is, is we're going to use these initial conditions to come up with two simultaneous equations that we then have to solve. So here are the uh, two functions that we already derived, one for the uh, displacement, one for the velocity. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in their values at time t equals 0. So when x, um, the displacement at time t equals 0 here, I'm going to call x naught. We know the value, it's 5 centimeters, but a good rule of thumb is to always use algebra wherever you can, because it's a lot harder to make mistakes with algebra, uh, plus the fact if the question later on asks you for what would have happened if the initial displacement had been 2 centimeters, you can answer it, because you can just change the value of x naught. So always good practice, use algebra whenever possible. And this is going to be equal to a cosine. And then here I'm looking at this omega t. Well, when t is 0, omega t is 0. So this term disappears. And this is just equal to a times the cosine of phi. Now, the velocity at time t equals 0, again, we're going to call this v naught. Again, for algebra, uh, it's a lot easier with algebra. And we end up with a generic solution, which you can reuse in other problems with a little bit of care. Um, and so we end up with our initial velocity is v naught, and this now is minus omega a times the sine of phi. Again, because omega times t, when t is 0, becomes 0 and disappears. We're just left with phi. Now I'm going to rearrange this equation a little bit, and I'm going to write it as v naught over omega is equal to a times the sine of phi, and I'm going to call this equation 1, and I'm going to call this equation 2. Now I've got two equations, two simultaneous equations, and I've got two unknowns, the amplitude and phi. I know all of the terms on the uh, left-hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to, first of all, I've got to combine these to get rid of one of those two terms. And this is where there's a little bit of a mathematical trick that you should remember, because this type of simultaneous equation comes up a lot when dealing with initial conditions of simple harmonic oscillators. So the trick, first of all, to get rid of phi is to take equation 1, square it, and add it to equation 2, which is also squared. Now I'm going to start with the right-hand side here of both equations, and so I'm going to end up with a squared times sine squared phi plus a squared times cosine squared phi, and that's going to be equal to x naught squared plus v naught squared over omega squared. Now hopefully now it's become clear why I did that, because on the left-hand side of this new equation, I can take out a factor of a squared, and if I do that, I get sine squared phi plus cosine squared phi. Well, sine squared of any angle plus the cosine squared of the same angle is always 1. That's a trig identity, and so this side just becomes a squared, and it's equal to x naught squared plus v naught squared over, oops, omega squared. So I can now write down an expression for the amplitude, which is the square root of x naught squared plus v naught squared over omega squared. Now, if I put in my numbers here, x naught is 5 centimeters, v naught is 200 kilometers per second, and omega is 10 to the 6 times pi. So I've got to take care of the units here. This is in centimeters. This is in kilometers per second. So taking care of the units. But if you do that all correctly, what you should end up with is an amplitude of 8.09 centimeters. And so that is the amplitude of the motion. So here we are back with our two original simultaneous equations, and now what I need to do is I need to eliminate the amplitude and find the initial phase. So I'm going to take 1 and I'm going to divide it by 2, 
Now when I do that, I can see I'm going to have a sine phi divided by a cosine phi. The amplitude terms are going to cancel out, and I'm left with sine phi divided by cosine phi, and that of course is just the tangent of phi. So tangent of phi is going to be equal to this divided by this, so that's just minus v naught over x naught times omega. And now, of course, all I need to do to find phi is take the inverse uh, tangent um, of minus v naught over x naught times omega. Now, if I put in the numbers, again, being careful, we've got centimeters and kilometers, I've got to put in the right uh, prefaces. If I'm careful with the numbers, what I should get is a minus 0 0.905 radians. And that's another thing to remember is always make sure if you're numerically evaluating this, have your calculator in radians mode. So I've got the initial phase. So are we done? Well, not quite. Because when we took this inverse tangent here, our calculator confidently told us the solution. But the calculator had to pick from two possible solutions. And normally the calculator algorithm will pick uh, a, an answer that is between minus pi over 2 and plus pi over 2. But that's, there's another identical solution to this uh, inverse tangent that lies outside that range and still within the range minus pi to plus pi. And so we need to make sure that we picked the right one. The reason this ambiguity comes about is because when we have this inverse tangent here, um, and if, we, if the thing we're taking the inverse tangent of is negative, it's never clear whether the negativity comes from the initial velocity or from the initial displacement. And so there's a, a, a twofold ambiguity here. You could have a negative initial velocity or a negative initial displacement, or in our case, where both are positive, the other solution, if we'd have made both of these initial velocity and the initial displacement, both of them negative, then we would have got exactly the same answer from the calculator. So there's two possible initial conditions here which give us the same value that we're taking this inverse tangent of. So mathematically, the calculator can't know which one is correct. We have to do that by hand. And the way we do that is we go back to our old uh, trig rule, uh, the old cast rule, right? So hopefully you remember this uh, from when you learned trigonometry, that if we have an angle here, so in this line here, we always measure it relative to the positive x-axis. So we measure it uh, relative to this axis here. So if I take the sine, the cosine, or the tangent of an angle that lives in this quadrant, they will all be positive. If I take it in this, if the angle's in this quadrant, only the sine will be positive, hence s. Both the tangent and the cosine will be negative. If I take it in this quadrant, the tangent is positive, sine and cosine are both negative. And if I take it in this quadrant, then only cosine is positive and the other two are negative. Hence, the initials form the letter cast, and so this is known as the cast rule. So, how is that relevant here? Well, our initial phase angle here we got was minus 0.905 radians, and so that lives in this quadrant here, right? So the calculator picked the angle that lives in the cosine quadrant, so only cosine is positive. So now we have to go back and we have to look at our expressions for the initial displacement and the initial velocity. Right? This is when, um, remember, t is zero, so there's no omega t here. Now, if I look here, I know that x naught is positive. It's plus five centimeters. We don't need to know the values, only worry about the sign. So this is positive, and I've got an angle that's in the cosine quadrant here. So cosine is positive, and so I've got a positive uh, number on this side and a positive number on this side, so it works out and, and is fine. If I look at the initial velocity here, well, my initial velocity is plus 200 kilometers per second, so this is positive. And I have a sine here, the sine of the angle, where we're in this quadrant here, so sine is negative. But I've got another negative, you know, minus one here in front. And when I multiply those two together, I'm going to get a positive uh, answer here. So I've got positive answer here, positive answer here. This checks out and it works. So in this case, the calculator guessed the right answer. 
not always going to be the case and sometimes you need to put in the answer that's up here remember it's always a, a difference of pi or 180 degrees but pi radians different and so had we had a negative five centimeter initial displacement and a negative 200 kilometer per second uh, velocity then this would have still um, given us the same value inside this inverse tangent function and the calculator would therefore have given us the same angle but in that case had these both been negative this would have been the wrong answer so always always check you've got a 50 percent chance of getting it right so always make sure that you have got it right so if we now write down the function um, as a the function of the displacement uh, uh, as a function of time, then we end up with uh, the amplitude, which was 8.09 uh, centimeters, times the cosine of, uh, and then we have 10 to the six times pi, because uh, that's omega times t minus 0 0.905. And so we solved part A with this function here. Okay, so for part B, we're asked to calculate what the maximum force on the antiproton is. Now, to do this, we're going to have to use Newton's second law, which relates the force to the mass and the acceleration. Now, we know how to calculate the acceleration for a simple harmonic oscillator, then all we have to do is multiply it by the mass, so we need a physical constant here, and that is the mass of a proton is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. Now, this is the mass of a proton. Of course, we're dealing with an antiproton, but there's a fundamental symmetry of nature that tells us that the mass of an antiproton will be exactly the same as the mass of a proton. Um, if that's ever broken, so we ever find an antiparticle who's got a different mass to its equivalent particle, then we've broken the symmetry behind relativity, and breaking relativity would be pretty phenomenal. So um, particle physicists do do experiments to check that the mass of particles are exactly the same to within the accuracy of their experiments as the equivalent particle because there's a Nobel Prize in it for anybody who can prove that they're different. So, going back to here, we need to calculate the acceleration. Well, we've got the velocity. If you remember, we calculated that for part A, and so this was our expression we got for velocity, and we just differentiate it with respect to time once again, and we get minus uh, omega squared times A, times now again cosine omega t plus phi where we get this extra omega factor when we differentiate from the omega t inside here and when we differentiate sine goes to cosine so here's our acceleration now what we want is we want the maximum force and so this will be equal to the mass times the maximum acceleration since the mass is constant so to calculate the maximum acceleration, we need to look at our function that gives the acceleration as a function of time. Now, the thing that makes it vary is this cosine term here. But we know that cosine can only vary between minus one to plus one, right? It can't go outside that bound. So the maximum acceleration is going to occur when cosine is minus one because we get minus one times the minus here, and we get the acceleration is omega squared times a. So the maximum value of the acceleration will be plus omega squared times a, and so we know that the maximum force is going to be our proton mass, which is the same as the antiproton mass, times um, omega squared times the amplitude, and if we put all of our numbers in from the previous parts, again, making sure to uh, be careful with prefaces because we got an amplitude in centimeters, um, what we end up with is that the maximum force is 1.34 femptonewtons, which is 1.34 times 10 to the minus 15 newtons. So that is our maximum force. So for the last part, we're asked to uh, calculate the amplitude of an antiproton which starts with half the energy of the initial antiproton. So to solve this, we need to remember an important relationship between the energy of a simple harmonic oscillator and the amplitude. And the relationship is that the total energy of the oscillator is proportional to the square of the amplitude. So what we've done here is we've had 
uh, energy, uh, the new energy is equal to a half of the initial energy. And so what that means is that the new amplitude squared is going to be equal to half of the original amplitude squared, right? Because of this proportionality, if I halve the energy, so my new energy is half of what I had originally, then this the new the square of the new amplitude is going to be half the square of the old amplitude. So all I have to do now is take the square root of both sides of this equation, and I end up with that the new amplitude is the old amplitude divided by the square root of 2, which is point... Uh, so basically it's the old amplitude multiplied by 0 0.707. So about 70% of the amplitude of the original uh, antiproton. It's not half, right? This squared term here is important, so remember this relationship between the total energy and the amplitude, and you'll be able to solve questions like this. So that's it for our example problem. So what we've done is we've solved the amplitude and initial phase for an oscillator given generic starting conditions. Now obviously not all examples are going to be antiprotons trapped in a penning trap at CERN, um, but the same method applies equally to a mass spring system, a pendulum, or any simple mechanical oscillator, or even more exotic things like electromagnetic waves. So the trick, remember, is to uh, create two simultaneous equations, one by using the initial displacement and the second by using the initial velocity. Those will have cosine and sine terms in them, so you square and add them to get the amplitude and you divide them in order to get the initial phase. Now, the other thing you always need to remember to be careful about is that when you're calculating the initial phase, there's two ambiguous solutions, and your calculator will just pick one, and that's not necessarily the right one. So always remember, when you get your phase from your calculator, check to see that the sign of the initial displacement and the sign of the initial velocity are correct. If they are, the calculator guessed right. If not, you need to take the other solution. So that's it on how to solve the in, uh, amplitude and initial phase for generic initial conditions. Yeah.